Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Do you know what is the most unhappy country in the world? Anybody want to take a guess? No, it's not the United States, I promise. It's actually the country of Moldova. Anybody know where Moldova is? Okay. Uh, do you want to tell everyone where Moldova is? That's okay. I'll tell everyone. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. It is a small country between Ukraine and Romania. I had to look it up myself, so don't feel bad. Uh, this small country was once a Soviet republic. Now, uh, Ruth Lievenhoven is a gentleman who's a sociologist, and he studies uh, countries and their happiness factors and what leads to a country being happy or not. Now, the reason that Moldova is so unhappy is because the trust level among its citizens is so low. Well, why is it so low? Well, because in Moldova, in order to get anything done, you have to bribe somebody. In fact, citizens refuse to go to any doctor under the age of 35 because students bribe their teachers in order to get good grades. And because of that, most people believe that doctors under the age of 35 have literally bribed their way into a medical degree. But even more so than that, when they do go to the doctor, they've had to bribe the doctor in order to get the treatment that they know they need. Moldova is an unhappy country because there is no trust among its citizens. And as the amount of untrust goes up, so does the amount of fear. And as both of those rise, the uh, isolation sets in, and the amount of suffering sets in. And we've all kind of been in those situations, haven't we? We've been in those communities where all of a sudden somebody starts scheming to get on top of the heap, and all of a sudden then the untrust sets in, and the fear sets in, and everybody starts siloing themselves off. And before you know it, nobody's happy. And fear's kind of like that. Now, fear in and of itself, it's just an emotion. And emotions are neither good nor bad. They just are. It's how we respond to them that makes the difference. And fear, it actually can be a very good thing if you think about it. Fear when we were back and wanderers out in the wilderness, it kept us safe. You know, we didn't go up to those big creatures out in the wilderness with the fangs and the claws. We didn't want to get eaten. We were afraid. But when we let fear run unchecked, that's when it gets to be problematic. When we let fear run unchecked, that's when it leads to anger. And when we let that anger run unchecked, that's when it leads to hate. And when that hate runs unchecked, that's when it leads to division and isolation, and it leads to suffering. Sound kind of familiar to my Star Wars fans out there? You know, Master Yoda, fear leads to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Maybe George Lucas was on to something, even in those disastrous things he called the prequels. But I digress. Fear is one of those things that it all depends on how we respond to it, on how it plays out in our lives. And this month, we're talking all about resetting our ideas of certain things. And today, we're talking about resetting our ideas about fear and how fear plays in to new beginnings. Because in our story from Matthew's Gospel, 
there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of doubt. And it plays an intricate role in how the story plays out. So let's take a moment and place ourselves in the midst of that story. Jesus He's finally getting that time that he needed by himself, that he wanted at the beginning of last week's story, because today is just a continuation of where last week cut off. Remember, he went out into the wilderness to pray by himself, and the crowds followed him, asking him to heal them, and he ended up feeding 15,000 of them. Well, they finally left, and he's finally getting that time to himself that he wanted to pray. And so he sends the disciples off in the fishing boat across the Sea of Galilee. And he says, go ahead of me. I will catch up to you. And so the disciples go. And while they're out on the Sea of Galilee, a storm comes up. Now, our text puts it, they were getting battered by the waves, and there was a wind it makes it sound like, eh, it wasn't so bad. This was not a light summer storm on the lake. This was a roll the boat side to side, hold on for your dear life, pray that the boat does not turtle itself, which means the mass goes down, the bottom comes up, and you hold on. The disciples had every right to be afraid And then, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of getting tossed to, fro, up, down, left, right, they see something. What's that? What's that off in the distance? I don't know. It can't be Jesus. Our minds must be playing tricks on them. We've been out here for too long. We're too tired. We've been through enough. No, no, it's, it's coming closer. Well, Jesus can't walk on water, can he? It must be a ghost. That's the only thing that makes sense, right? But didn't they just see Jesus feed 15,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish? They don't trust what they've just seen. And so Peter says, If it is you, Jesus, call me out of this boat to come to you on the water. Did you catch that? If it is you, Jesus. He still doesn't trust what he's seeing with his own eyes. If. And Jesus says, come, come, Peter. And so Peter gets out of the boat, and he walks on the water. He walks on the water. It's amazing. And as he's walking, the wind hits him. And it's almost like it wakes him up, because all of a sudden, he starts to sink. It's almost as if he says, what the heck am I doing? And as he sinks beneath the waves, he calls out, Lord, save me. And Jesus comes over and says, why did you doubt? And he pulls pulls Peter up out of the water and places him back in the boat. And the disciples rejoice, and they declare that he truly is God's son. Now, let's go back really quickly to that phrase that Jesus utters to Peter. Why did you doubt? Why did you not trust? Why did you fear that what I said was untrue? Why? Were you afraid that I would not support you? A lot of scholars, some really big name, wonderful, fabulous biblical scholars, translate and understand this as Jesus come over and shaming Peter for his lack of faith. 
Peter, you blockhead, why did you not trust me? Why did you not trust that it was me walking on the water? Why did you not trust that I would keep you on the water? Why would you doubt that I would do everything for you? Why, Peter, did you lack faith? I don't think Jesus is like that. I don't think Jesus is going to come over and shame Peter. I think something else is going on over here. I don't think that Jesus is saying to Peter, why did you doubt me? I think Jesus is saying to Peter, why did you doubt yourself? Why did you fear that you could not do what I called you to do? Why did you not trust in your abilities that I called you to do? You said, call me out of this boat. And I said, come. I said, come because I knew that you could do it. I knew that you could do it all the way back when I called to you, Peter, and said, come and follow me. Peter, why did you doubt yourself? I believe in you. Why can't you believe in you? Gives it a whole new meaning. Why do you fear, Peter? that you can't do what I do, because I know that you can. And how often do we fear that we are inadequate? How often do we fear that somehow Jesus has gotten it wrong with us too? How often do we not trust that God has actually called us to be his beloved children? to trust that we too can do what God called us to do and who God called us to be. This is where that resetting fear comes in. Because the truth of the matter is, God has very much called us to do what he does. God has called us to go out into the world and to share that great commission, to share everything that he has taught us, to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God has faith that we can do it. We reset our idea of fear, and we reset our idea of fear of what is to come. We often are afraid of the change that comes in the future. We're often afraid and don't trust that we have a place in the future. But why? God has a place for us both individually and as a congregation. Why do we doubt that God can use us? Because the fact of the matter is, you are made in God's image. Each time you show up here, you bring God into this building, in your face, in your hands, and in your feet. And each time you go out into the world and you serve your neighbor, you are the hands and the feet and the face of Christ to them. Each time you come together as the body of Christ, God is active and working in this world. God has a use for this congregation, not just here in Trail Creek, not just here in Michigan City, but around the globe. If it were not so, we would not be here. And God, God has a use for the church, even in this day and age. 
We often hear we live in this post-Christian age, but here's the thing. Recent studies have shown that the millennials, that is my generation, and Generation Z, that's the generation behind me, are actually the most spiritually open generations there have been in a very long time. The difference is this. They want to know that it is safe to explore, to discover, and to ask questions. They want to know that it is okay to have doubts and that it is okay to explore what that means. It's time to reset our idea of what it means to have fear, and it's time to reset our idea of what it means to doubt. God has faith in us that we can do what he does. And that is to bring the good news of Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and our salvation through Jesus Christ into a weary world. God believes that we can still be active in this world. God believes that we can help to change the world through him. So why do we doubt that? God believes in us. Will you trust that and stop fearing that it's not true? And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.